Hello from San Francisco. I'm Ken Ben Muller. It's really a pleasure to participate in this workshop on the development of innovative endoscopic devices. And my thanks to the chairpersons, Dr. Hara Inui and Hiro Yamamoto for the invitation. I'm going to be speaking on the development of the LAMS, the lumen opposing metal stent. As I'm sure many in the audience know, Nip Sahendra pioneered many of the therapeutic procedures that we perform daily in our endoscopy units around the world, notably biliary stent drainage, injection hemostasis, glue for gastric varices, and many devices are also named after him, mechanical lithotripter, the stent retrieval device, uh, some examples. I had the privilege of working side by side with Nip Sahendra in Hamburg, Germany over uh, seven years and innovation was a part of his uh, school and his uh, teaching. We made most of the devices ourselves, you know, the sphincter tomes, the catheters, the stents, uh, you name it, we made it. These were custom made, they were tailored to the individual patient and they were based on the need at hand. So innovation was a natural offshoot of our daily work in endoscopy. It is said that necessity is the mother of invention. Innovation is inspired by a difficulty or a challenge that we face. It is a process that starts by identifying a need. What is needed is dot, dot, dot. And the solution should be simple, easy, quick, effective, and affordable. It should be a simple tool or method. It should be easy to learn, quick to perform, should provide effective outcomes at an affordable cost. I'm very privileged to have witnessed the evolution of EOS guided therapy since its inception in 1992, when we performed the first EOS guided pseudocyst drainage using a prototype echo endoscope curved linear array, puncturing the pseudocyst under ultrasound guidance, inserting a wire, and then exchanging the echo endoscope for a duodenoscope, and then placing a pigtail stent to drain the cyst. We use the over the wire Seldinger technique, borrowed from the interventional radiologists consisting of four steps, accessing the cyst, inserting a guide wire into the cyst, dilating the tract with a balloon or a bougie, and then placing a stent. But applied to endoscopy, we encountered many technical challenges with the Seldinger technique. This required multiple over the wire device exchanges and working a far distance from the target the wire access could be lost and the procedure was tedious and time consuming. There's also a step off between the guide wire and the catheter device. This resulted in difficulty traversing the wall and cautery was often required to enable penetration of a thickened or fibrotic wall. The Seldinger technique is multi-step and with that, we take risks at each of these steps. So it's multi-risk. When we remove the needle, we have a gap, a step off between the wire and the tract. This can result in leak. When we insert our dilator over the wire, this can displace our target organ, the cyst. When we dilate over the wire, this can result in perforation. When we remove the dilator, we again have a gap between the wire and the tract leak. And when we insert our device, our stent over the wire, this can result in displacement of the target. And perforation is the most feared complication among these steps. We also face technical challenges with stent placement using standard tubular configured stents designed for treating lumen obstruction. 
There's no lumen to lumen apposition and the ends project into both of these lumens, which can cause a trauma and injury to the walls. The plastic stents have a small fixed diameter, so there can be leakage around the stent. And when we place multiple stents, this requires multiple guide wires and multiple steps. If we use a metal stent, such as a covered SEMS, this can result in maldeployment and migration. Transluminal therapy requires an intentional perforation, something that we otherwise avoid with endoscopic therapy. Here you see the gallbladder and the duodenum and this echogenic layer interposed between the two structures is fat tissue. The gallbladder is not adherent to the duodenal wall. So when we place a stent to drain the gallbladder, we have this interposed space into which we can have a leakage. So what we need are tools to prevent leak and perforation. We have to think outside the box. We need a transluminal stent or a LAMS that is covered and self-expanding to seal off the tract, it should be lumen opposing, and it should also provide a port for transluminal intervention. We need a transluminal stent and delivery system that eliminates over the wire exchange and accesses the target lumen with a stent loaded catheter. The LAMS concept is summarized in the patent filing from 2008, a device whereby two luminal structures in the body may be drawn towards each other and a fluid conduit formed in between. And here you can see in the diagram how the deployed flanges of this expandable metal stent draw the two walls together to form that conduit. The axial lambs has four key features, consists of a self-expanding nitinol mesh. It has anchoring double-walled flanges. It has a short one centimeter saddle and it has full silicon covering to prevent leakage. There are four stages to development of a medical device. The first is design and development. This is where we take a concept and then we establish proof of concept. We do benchtop prototyping and simulation tests and we perform animal studies. The next step is called the VNV, verification and validation. This is where the final design is developed. The verification addresses the product with benchtop testing. The validation addresses the user interface and experience with clinicals. Third is the regulatory stage. This in the US is the FDA, in Europe, the CE mark. In Japan, it's the PMDA, which is the Pharmaceuticals and Medical Device Agency. And then finally, we have the commercial launch. And typically, we also have a post-market phase that monitors the outcomes following the commercial launch. Prototyping can be very time consuming and cost intensive. We have our goals and solutions. On the one hand, we want lumen apposition, but we also want to avoid ischemia. The solution is a large flange surface area. We want to resist migration, but we want the device to be removable. The solution, double walled flanges. We want the device to be compressible and yet resume its shape after deployment. The solution was a 48 night no wire braid. We want the device to be uniform with durable coating and yet the coating should be thin and conforming. The solution is to use silicon and to manually brush this as you can see here onto the mesh. So our optimal flange designed 
was double walled 90 degrees to the saddle, twice the lumen diameter, and it had a one to two millimeter lip, as you can see here, to optimize the pullout force to prevent migration. Benchtop simulation requires the development of models that simulate human anatomy. Here two frames that move independent of one another. They are mobile against one another, simulating two non-adherent walls. And we have silicon sheets mounted on the frames. So in this video, you can see penetration of the first wall and then penetration of the second wall, immediately deployment of the distal flange and then the proximal flange inside the lumen. The next step is animal studies. We use the gallbladder as our surrogate for a non-adherent fluid collection. And we implanted the prototype LAMS and published our results in 2011, establishing proof of concept. Verification testing addresses the product specs. Did you design the product right? We document the biomechanics, for example, the pullouts and the radial strength. You can see here that comparing Axios with the wall stent, Axios had more than fivefold the pullout strength, but the wall stent had more than twofold the radial strength. We determine and document the biocompatibility and the sterilization and shelf life. Validation testing addresses the clinical user interface. So did you design the right product for the patient? This includes the uh, instruction for use and the labeling, the physician training requirements, the clinical study requirements, the first in man experience and the results of the registry study, which ideally should be multi-center to establish safety and efficacy. The first in man study was performed in Japan in Dr. Itoi's unit, 20 patients, 10 pseudocyst drainage, five gallbladder drainages, excellent technical and clinical success, transluminal interventions in seven of these patients with no complications, and the stents were removed without complication after a median of 35 days. The registry then was multi-center establishing safety and efficacy, 33 patients, seven centers in the US and Europe. And this finally led to the FDA clearance in 2014. So the end product is the LAMS and HOT delivery system a one-step, one-device, exchange-free platform, enabling us to access the target lumen with the LAMS loaded catheter, and then without any over-the-wire exchange to be able to immediately deploy the LAMS. Puncture, distal flange deployment, and proximal flange deployment without any risk of leak or perforation. So in conclusion, Innovation requires thinking outside the box. And I'm gonna leave you with two quotes from this famous innovator. In the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. So when we face these difficulties and challenges, it's an opportunity to think about the solutions. And if you always do what you always did, you will always get what you always got. That's why we need innovation in interventional endoscopy. Thank you.